Right, so, oh my goodness, you took over a month early and I came did. in in the midst of a hurricane. I did. A uh, lot of allegations against your predecessor, Dr. Boutros. Many have questioned the board and uh, how they did not know about the bonuses. And among your first actions were announcing an independent audit of the board's actions and procedures. And you promised to make those uh, findings public. But what I want to ask you, I have no doubt you've been watching all of this unfold. Do you have confidence in the board? I do. I actually do. And um, I'm saying that unequivocally with a heightened degree of confidence. Uh, the, the board sounded the alarm. They, they jumped forward with, with a, a lot of courage and in in, in very much was put in a very difficult situation. Um, but with that being said, the board acted appropriately. And as a result of that, yes, everyone is under the microscope. Every, everyone is being evaluated. And we're doing the right thing. By opening ourselves up, we're being extremely prudent. And uh, I'm a clinician, so I say we're doing a full-fledged colonoscopy, if you will, to evaluate everything and looking very deeply under the hood. Um, and we're going to do what's right at the end of the day. So and why yeah. was an independent audit necessary, in your opinion? Well, uh, an independent audit, the importance of that is third party. So while we trust ourselves and we trust our expertise and our experiences, is trust but validate and trust but verify. And is an outside extra set of eyes uh, to, to really uh, en enlist an opinion and be able to in instill a sense of trust back in the, in the brokenness of the, of the system. So obviously, uh, you know, reputation is bruised uh, from that point of view. Um, so an independent audit really, really uh, helps to amplify that. When can we expect the results, do you think? We, we are moving comprehensively through the process, but we want to do it right as opposed to being hasty. Um, so we, we fully expect a, a turnaround very, very soon uh, with full recommendations, full action, um, and, and, and certainly we are committed to being transparent in, in uh, publishing what our findings are. Um, yeah. The board did make resolutions to prevent what happened from ever happening again. Mm -hmm. um, but now that you're CEO, how will those checks and balances work? So um, obviously we've had to course correct. We've had to put up some additional guardrails. We had to put some additional uh, uh, process measures in, in place uh, just to be preventative. And again, even, even processes like bringing in an outside opinion um, taking myself out of out of the process and and trusting trusting the process and trusting outside evaluators. So we're putting a lot of processes in place uh, just to safeguard. But at the same time, we are reinforcing older process that perhaps just needed needed to be recalibrated and adjusted. You are coming from Chicago. I am. I have no doubt you know how politics works <laughs> and all of that thing. But uh, I, I want to know if, if you've learned anything from this experience and this, forgive me, trial by fire, if you will. You know, uh, at the end of the day, the, I think this speaks to my leadership style. And yeah, I'm, I'm born and raised in Chicago, a very political city, uh, a very political state. So I think I've been armed for this. I've, I've built up my leadership muscle a, a, along the years, and I've always been one to run into challenge, not run away from it. Um, and I, I, I ran into this uh, fully expecting that there was going to be some circumstances, that there was going to be some roadblocks and obstacles al along the way. But really, my heart poured out for the community that we serve and for the community internal to the organization that really just needed uh, a show of support and a show of trust and a show of stability. And that's why I'm unwavered by that. And I really want to turn the, the, the light and attention back on, on the real-time heroes that are making it happen every single day. So that's what is motivating me through that. Let's get to your mission, which mm -hmm. is most important. Your passion <coughs> for ending health care disparity is quite clear, mm -hmm. but it's also personal. Mm -hmm. Can you explain how this drives you? 
So um, I've explained my story um, and my story is not easy. My story is, is built on a lot of pain, a lot of bad experiences. Um, so I always describe my story as been, been one of misdiagnoses, late diagnoses, failure to provide adequate information. I am a representative sample of what healthcare disparities actually looks like. It's impacted me greatly um, in individuals that were extremely close in, in my circle. I've lost my mother, both of my grandmothers. More recently, a year ago, I lost my baby sister to healthcare disparities. So it, it fuels my passion for disrupting the brokenness of the systems at, at large and to really change the healthcare system that, that is fundamentally broken. Um, so I'm, I'm inspired by eradicating healthcare disparities. I wanna make a difference and extend the, the, the lifespan of those that we serve. I wanna improve accessibility. I wanna make it affordable for everyone. Um, so all of those things I'm extremely motivated by and I strongly am optimistic and I'm encouraged and I'm highly confident that Metro Health can be the national model for really what that looks like and being able to have demonstrated proof and evidence by outcomes. And I can, I can showcase through example what that really looks like. I have no doubt you've done your homework and you're well aware of the high level of infant mortality and maternal mortality when it comes to childbirth. Can, is that one of the primary focuses you're gonna start with? Absolutely, so that, that is a focus and, and more. Um, so one glaring statistic that, that really just jumped out on a page is black women feel that, that, that they're ranked the lowest in, in the Cleveland area, including healthcare specific issues. So I'm gonna wrap my heart and soul around all of those, those key factors. Infant mortality, uh, the, the higher rates of, of mortality period in uh, the black and brown communities. So those particular things are gonna really anchor the vision that I set forth for Metro Health. And in days, the new facility opens and I would assume that's where. Absolutely, absolutely. So the entire new facility centered around women and infants is, is really centered around patient excellence and clinical excellence and health equity and innovation. So all of those, those elements with community voice incorporated within it is really what we're gonna to bring to life. None of this is gonna be easy though. Absolutely not. But your background leading an urban academic <coughs> healthcare system gave you insight into what the needs are here in Cuyahoga County. And, and many of these programs, such as the Institute of Hope, were mm -hmm. already in place. So in your opinion, what do you think is first on your agenda now leading Metro Health? You know, so I have, I have many firsts on, on, on my agenda, so I, I can really summarize it in, in four key categories. The first is clinical excellence. So I wanna be known for the highest level of quality care, the highest quality experiences uh, provided. So I really wanna lead Metro Health in terms of being a five-star organization, being a A-graded organization, all things quality outcomes, I really be, wanna be at the top. Uh, the second area is, is health equity and really making a, a pivotal difference in eradicating healthcare disparities, inclusive of infant mortality, uh, women's mortality, uh, you know, the th being three to four times more likely to die in childbirth as compared to other, other counterparts, really changing the, the perspective on the rankings on, on black women's health, minority health in, in, in general. So health equity is very important, inclusive of addressing the social drivers of health, uh, improving uh, access to transportation, affordable housing, uh, uh, addressing food insecurity. So all of those elements that really shape uh, the person's whole experience is, is definitely top of mind on my agenda. And the last two items, uh, continue to raise the bar in innovation. I think that uh, Metro Health has certainly tested the waters here. And I wanna continue to accelerate that uh, so we can 
redefine, reshape, reinvent new ways of, do, of doing what we do best. And then the last area is all about the community. Um, I'm absolutely passionate about adding voice and adding a seat at the table and really listening, hearing and heeding uh, what the community needs and translating that into action. When uh, at Sinai, mm -hmm. one of the things you did, you changed a lot of <laughs> outcomes, you raised a lot of great grades. Mm -hmm. um, are there any programs from Sinai that aren't here that you think need to be established? I think that we're, we're doing similar things. Um, uh, one of the great programs that I, that I brought to, to Sinai is I blanketed the entire community uh, that we served and offered uh, free non-emergent transportation to take uh, our, our patients to and from their destination so you can actually show up for your clinical visit and not show up in the emergency department because you've, you've uh, uh, pervased and, and delayed treatment and access to high quality care. I think that that is one profound program that is standing out um, as a need in this particular community and it, it makes a difference in so many different ways. Um, it, re it really touches on poverty as well because taking off that burden, the economic burden of trying to uh, determine how, how you're going to afford to access the care that you absolutely need. So that's just one program that stands out. Um, I think that we're doing a lot of similar things, but I would, I would take it and amplify it um, and, and really speaking to that health equity mission that I am so passionate about. Only 15% of the nation's health systems are led by women, <laughs> and only 6% of the top 100 hospitals have black CEOs. You are no doubt an inspiration to many. I saw your, your welcome video. But do you have any plans or ideas to help improve those numbers? I think that the move that the board made by choosing me in, the, in this role, and I'm ex extremely humbled and I'm extremely honored by that, makes a big statement and makes a big difference that um, we're moving in the direction of being the change that we want to see. So most definitely we, we need to change those statistics. And by being in this seat, I represent a sense of, of hope. I, I represent a sense of inspiration that other women, other minorities can absolutely do this. And it, it, I'm, I'm not going to say that to say that it's going to be a straight road without adversity and, and challenge, but I can tell you that I'm, I'm smoothing the way and I'm widening the, the, the doorway in um, to inspire the next generation of, of, of leaders. So I'm, I'm definitely going to make an investment on diversity and inclusion, um, definitely going to make a, 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 a path forward for how do we develop our next generation of leaders and encourage a sense that, okay, let's widen the, the, the gap on those uh, glaring statistics that are, are meaningful to me and, and should be meaningful for others as well. You have RN on your badge. I do. And that's one of many... Uh, you know, mm -hmm. letters behind your name, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, how long did you work as a nurse on the floor before you made that decision that you wanted to go into administration? And yeah. why did you decide that? You know, honestly, I, w I was always one of those that I worked for a very long time at the bedside, uh, regardless of whether I transitioned into senior leadership roles. I, I was that, that nurse who picked up a shift on, on the weekend to stay relevant. And I did that for the longest time. So I, so I actually um, was well into my senior executive years before I actually gave up the nursing hat. And, uh, and the only reason why I had to eventually make that decision to do that is, is I found myself stretching too thin and trying to do too much simultaneously because I'm a lifelong learner and I'm a lifelong teacher as well. So I made a decision that I wanted to invest in educating the next level of leaders and, and clinicians. And that's why I chose to actually give up the hat. So it wasn't um, un until a few years ago that I actually stepped away from, from the bedside and, and stopped actually practicing 
um, the art of, of, of nursing. Um, but it runs deeply in my, in my veins. Um, so I, I go back many generations of, of nursing. So I always knew it was going to be a calling for me. I just wanted to do something different with it. What do you do in your free time, <laughs> as if you have any? Oh, so I'm a, I'm a big family person. So I have four children. Um, so I'm, I'm very busy with my, with my four kids and, and, and two furry children. Um, so family is, a, is, is what it's all about when I, when I do have a, a moment to, to really catch my breath. And I, I place a high value in that. And that's, that's my premium. Um, so that's what I do in my spare time. Is anything about Cleveland, did it surprise you in any way? You know, honestly, um, the only big surprise for me is, 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 is more Midwest in a positive way than I uh, imagine. I'm from, I'm from the Midwest, I'm, I'm from Chicago, but the welcome that I received, and, and I'm not just talking about it at Metro Health, I feel like I've been warmly welcomed into the city, and um, the, the level of family type of atmosphere and just the, the feeling of being at home, I'm, I'm pleasantly surprised about that. I don't have to tell you that Cleveland is a medical mecca <laughs> and uh, healthcare is the number one uh, employer in, in this town. The, co the COVID pandemic devastated, and we have a lot of really tired mm -hmm. people right now, mm -hmm. and that has to be one of the things on the top of your list. Oh, you, absolutely. Uh, any idea how you're gonna make that happen? So I think that I'm off to uh, a rapid start on that. Um, I've dedicated myself to, as, as part of my early days, and, and this is just a part of my, my leadership style in general, is to get out in, in, into the trenches and, and really uh, listen, learn, understand. So how, how can I take some of the load off? And how can I remove those barriers, remove those obstacles? How can I make Metro Health the best place to work and fuel that passion and, and, and reduce the burden and reduce the burnout? Um, so that's something that's absolutely front and center. So I can't be able to even accomplish the lofty agenda uh, that I have for the organization without caring for the caregiver uh, and those that are, are those frontline heroes and th that are doing the courageous work every single day. So that is front and center. That's always going to be my priority. And um, I've, I've listened and I've learned quite a bit already and, I'm, and that's going to continue. Um, I've, I've started to spot out uh, what's important in, ter in terms of those core challenges and, that's, and I, th I think that that's how we're going to be able to make a difference there. Final thoughts. What would you like to say to Northeast Ohio who's meeting you for the first time? I just wanted to um, just indicate how honored how humbled. Um, I consider this to be the privilege of a lifetime being able to serve the great people of the communities at large of, of Northeast Ohio. So I just wanted to say thank you. Um, I'm here to partner. I'm here to listen. I'm here to learn. I'm here to make a difference. So um, that's, that's what I'm all about. We look forward to watching you work and I look forward to working with you. <laughs> well, it's been an honor. Thank you so much. Thank Dr. you. Sweet.